let's see our next example. Yeah, let me tell you in the first place that uh, in this position, Larson is playing white. Actually, on the other side of the board, we have Matanovic, uh, who was the founder of the chess informant, if I'm not mistaken, a very famous chess publication. And this position, objectively speaking, it's not really that uh, advantageous for white. Uh, black is solid here. Maybe a slight uh, advantage only in this position. But Bent Larsen, he was known as the master of psychology. He, he would know very well which moves would make life difficult for his opponents. He would put little traps, perhaps you can say. Uh, he could feel what his opponent would be about to, to play. And sometimes he would even adjust his style to, to the profile of the opponent. Uh, players who would use a lot of time on the clock, he would look for more complex positions so that they would use up a lot of time. Uh, yeah, he was very clever in this sense in chess psychology. And he, exp he explains all this very well in his books. He was a fantastic writer as well. If I should recommend just one chess uh, biography, I think I would go for uh, Bent Larsen's books. They are really entertaining and you will learn a lot of stuff in those books. So let's talk a little about chess psychology. Bent Larsen played at this moment rook c4. It's not necessarily the best move, but uh, it contains a very nice trap. Black should have played something like knight f6 here, bringing the knight, uh, yeah, trying to swap off this knight, which is slightly uh, annoying for, for Black. But uh, what do you think uh, Black played here? If somebody plays rook c4 against you, what do you think would be Black's first uh, instinct here? Black's first reflex in this position? Well, you must be thinking that perhaps my opponent is trying to uh, double on the c file, right? So let's play rook c8. And that's what happened in the game. Black played here, rook c8. And at this point, it's your move. White to play and win. Two minutes. Okay, time's up. We have two candidate moves here. Uh, they are very similar, but I think one of them is better than the other. Let's uh, listen to Aradia Panda. Aradia, you're on. What to play with white here? Okay, so like my move was on knight take e6. Uh huh. What's the idea? What happens if I take? Yeah, if you take um, um, queen c3, it's just a double attack, attacking your rook and the uh -huh. and checkmate. Very nice. Okay, so. Uh, if I take on c4, which is your follow-up? Yeah, like, I didn't look at this that much, but I was thinking just, like, 
um, knight h6, um, g take h6, queen take h6, uh -huh. should Very just nice. win. That's it, that's it. Knight is combination, right? Yeah. We're going to get mate now. Uh, since we have two pieces uh, along with the queen uh, controlling g7, black cannot avoid mate here. Uh, rook c2 and simply king h3, right? So, yeah, you're right. Uh, thanks, uh, Radia. That's exactly what happened in the game. Let's see again if we can understand this correctly. Uh, rook c4, not uh, a particularly strong move, but psycho psychologically uh, extremely powerful because uh, black might uh, run into this uh, trap, uh, rook c8. He should have played knight f6 instead. However, uh, after rook c8, some people are saying knight f5. That's extremely tempting as well, with the same idea of meeting e takes f5 with queen c3. I also looked at this move, but I think that perhaps black would take on c4. And the difference is that after knight takes c7, I can go king f8, and after b takes c4, I think the bishop is hanging, no? On b2, right? So it's not, uh, it's not so clear. While in the game, if we start with knight takes e6, this is different, right? Because now we have the check on h6 and uh, the black king cannot go to, to f8, right? Because the knight is there. So I think that's the big difference here. Uh, also, despite the fact that we're also winning a pawn, right? Uh, by knight takes e6. So this is about, you could say, but just uh, psychology. Uh, if you can read your opponent's mind, so to speak, uh, you can have a lot of, of, su of success in this uh, sense. So rook c4, very nice move. Uh, yeah, Larsen was playing in a tournament of the peace. You know, this is the Cold War uh, period in, in, I mean, human history, uh, 1965. Uh, Larsen was very strong in those years. Uh, and let me tell you that he, he played against all the world champions from Potvinnik to Karpov, and he actually managed to beat all of them, with no exception. Uh, you can, you can do the list yourself, uh, Botvinnik, Smyslov, uh, Petrosian, Spassky, Fischer, Karpov, and so on. So he, he won at least one time against all of them. So that's, that's impressive. We won't have time to look at all those games <laughs> tonight, but uh, I will show you some of those examples. So the Tournament of the Peace, yeah, it was held in 1965. I guess it had something to do with the tension between the US and the Soviet Union or, or something like that. Okay. Let's continue. Let's leave politics and let's continue with chess. So, one interesting feature uh, of Ent Larsen is that he was extremely strong against weaker players. He would sometimes lose against the strongest players in the tournament, but he would be very effective against uh, those of the players who had, you can say, less uh, rating in, in the tournament. Uh, really, really powerful. And this goes very well with his profile, that he would always uh, try to win his games and if he occasionally would uh, suffer a loss well you can be sure that the next day he will try to to win for the coming uh, rounds so here we have a game where he's playing with a old grandmaster bernstein was already rather old at this point and this is the first game where larsen wins against a grandmaster this game is in 1954 in the olympiad so let's have a look very quickly at the game uh, we have a funny move here, c4. You won't see this move very often nowadays. It's not played very much uh, in this particular position. Black played bishop g4. I think that players uh, in the modern uh, times would play rather e5 instead here and play like Carlsen. They would play some setup, like a Botvinnik setup with g6 and so on. But, uh, well, Larsen played bishop g4. Just as in the case of Anderson and Petrosian, Larsen was also, you can say, uh, he was very happy about getting knights against bishops. He was a very strong player with the knights, so maybe that also explains his choice here, bishop g4. White play d4, c takes, queen takes. Yeah, this is already a weird position. You won't come across it very often. It was perfectly possible to take on, on f3, but I suppose that Larsen, just like we were talking, psychologically speaking, he wanted to keep some tension and make it possible for his opponent to, to go astray. So he played here. Knight f6, knight c3, g6, dragon setup. And uh, Arnav says that bishop g4 looks odd now. Well, if that seems odd to you, now look at white's next move. 
this I think is really odd. White is going to play bishop b2. Larsen says it's, it's okay, but uh, personally, I don't uh, really like it because I, I think if white is going to end up with double pawns, I, I don't want to leave control of the f4 square. Although you can notice that this is not something that Anderson or Pettigrew and Petrosian would play with white colors, right? This is a really weird uh, opening from, from white. I think that in modern times, a move like queen e3 would be much more normal and then just bishop e2 and let's say something like this. This would have been normal, but anyway, uh, white play b3, bishop g7, bishop e2. And here we have a typical uh, Larsen move. Most people would just cast over here. But I would just ask uh, all of you, we want to put a timer. Uh, what would you play with black here? Which move do you like for, for black? Which would be the, the most uh, unpleasant move for white? What do you think? Yeah, that Danielle has a theory here. Yeah, you're right, Danielle. Uh, we can listen to you at this moment, uh, Danielle. I will unmute you. Which move do you like for black here, Danielle? This guy seems pretty tricky, so I think he'll play queen a5 and just try to, like, 94. Exactly. Very nice. I, I'm sure you maybe you have seen this idea also from, I mean, modern uh, opening theory, the accelerated dragon. You come across this situation. What happens if I play just bishop e2, Daniel? Now you win a pawn, right? Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> I do. This is a standard trick if you play the... I've never played the dragon. Let's think. Oh, you played the play dragon, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you can work it out. You have a, a so kind of double double pin here, so something knight should. Ninety-six, ninety-four. Exactly, ninety-six, and whatever the queen goes, if it goes to e3 or to d2, it doesn't matter. Black can just take on e4. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Excellent work. This trick, any dragon player knows about this, but uh, in those days it was not so common. We're talking 1954 here, so very nice move. Queen a5, already the old grandmaster has to be a little careful about where to put his pieces. And uh, he played here knight d2. Uh, the computer also suggests the move a3. And I think Larsen would enjoy uh, the following variation, knight c6, queen e3, and just take on e4. This looks very nice. It's true that now white can play b4, but after knight takes before, a takes before, queen takes before. Uh, Black has a lot of counterplay, and he has three pawns for, for the piece, right? So this looks really nice for, for Black. In the game, White played knight d2, and then, yeah, now we can't double his pawns anymore, but also White is losing time. Yeah, Black is better after queen a5, David, completely right. Queen a, uh, knight c6, sorry. And here, Larsen claims that White's next move is a huge mistake, so, uh, mistake and that's not completely clear. White played queen e3, but he said that he should have played queen d3. But for example, the computer here suggests a very typical move in this Maroxi structure, knight d7. Not only in order to play knight c5, but also black is preparing to go f5. This looks very nice for black. He is going to castle on the next move probably, and white still uh, sits with his king in the center. Anyway, let's see what happened in the game. Here white played queen e3. And now I would like you to send me white's, uh, sorry, black's, best move here. Let's see if you can find uh, Larsen's very clever move at this point. So I think I will just give you one minute on this one. Uh, one minute, please send me which move do you like the best for black. And there is a little trick involved here. So black to play. Find the most annoying move for white. So black's most powerful move. Okay, so several people found the right move, but uh, I'm asking you what happens if I play rook c1, and I don't get any answer yet. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's see who who was the first one to find this one. Uh, 
Austin Tang, I think. Okay, Austin, let's uh, let's see. Which is your preferred move here for Black? Uh, I would play uh, Knight B4. Uh huh. You can't castle, so Rook C1 is forced. Yeah, definitely. Rook C1. And now, what do you think Larson had in mind? Yeah, Jason Liang already found this one. Let's say Austin. H5. Thinking, uh, yeah, H5 is a very nice move. He played it later on. Yeah, you can play H5. Okay. But there is a stronger move here. Uh, thinking in mating patterns, you will find it. Let's uh, notice that the white king cannot move at this point. So what do you think Larson played? I think at this moment, his opponent fell off the chair when he saw Larson's next move. <laughs> was, was this too difficult? I don't think so. But uh, yeah, only... Uh, uh, only Jason and Asish found this one. Okay, Daniel as well. So, um, there is a queen sacrifice involved here, Austin. A queen sacrifice. How is that possible? Can you take that pawn? What uh, do you think? Um... Well, since I'm asking, probably you can, right? Yeah, Larson took the pawn. Oh, yeah, no, so, so if so if rook a1. Uh, now you can play knight b4. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Austin. That's what happened here in this game. Well, this didn't happen because the old man noticed uh, uh, Larson's evil plans. So after knight b4, rook c1, knight takes a2, he had to take on, on a2 with the knight. Uh, thanks to this very nice uh, mating trick, uh, black is winning a pawn, and also he's destroying white's defenses. So, uh, white took on a2, queen takes a2, and the position is already very difficult. Here, the old grandmaster, he puts his own little trap, bishop d4. But of course, uh, Larsen is awake. Uh, no chance that he will castle here on, and let his queen uh, be trapped. So he played first e5. And uh, here I noticed that some people like uh, Zoe, for example, suggested the move h5 and here actually Larson played h5 and this is something that I hope we will have to time time to talk about later. Larson really liked to advance his rook pawns, the h and the a pawns. He would advance them very early in the games. Even the b and the g pawns would move uh, early in his game, like the Larson opening, right? While very often he would keep his central pawns. He wasn't very happy about swapping his central pawns. You can see this uh, tendency in his uh, opening repertoire. He liked openings where he would keep both central pawns with either color. Uh, he really liked it, and he also explains this in his in his book. It's not something that I made up. Uh, he really enjoyed such positions with a, with a strong pawn center, so to speak. So h5, very nice move, preparing bishop h6. The game is basically decided now. You can see that rook a1 uh, queen c2 doesn't make sense anymore. He cannot play bishop d3 because then the bishop would be hanging. So that's the point behind the move e5 earlier on. There followed queen d3, queen a3. Now the queen should go back. And here, at this point, uh, the pawn on d16 is in the air. There are many ways in which we could continue here. You could even consider a brave move like uh, castling. This is, even this is possible. Because if white takes on d6, well, you would have some counterplay here, as you can see the white king is still in the center. But I like the move that he played in the game. He played here bishop f8. And what do you think he has in mind here? Well, I think it's uh, obvious to you. It's obvious. Yeah, he's preparing to go d5, right? Since these pieces are exposed. Yeah, and the uh, grandmaster noticed he played here uh, knight b1. However, this is not a solution to his Problems. He had to play here rook a2 prophylaxis. This was his only choice to continue the game. He played knight b1. And here Larsen noticed that he has two very interesting moves. He could play d5, of course, uh, threatening to take on, on b4. But I like the move that he played in the game even better. Yeah, like Sarvagna notices here, the best move is actually knight takes e4. That's much nicer. Queen takes e4, d5, and you can see that black is completely. Winning here, bishop takes 92, castling, and then black went on to win. So here you have move 22, and black is already winning. This was a typical pattern in Larson's games, especially when he was playing against somebody 
let's say, weaker, he will try to crush them from the very beginning. And that's uh, something very interesting. Uh, a lot of nice games, uh, thanks to this uh, tendency. He will just crush them in the opening. Okay, let's uh, move on. And uh, I also wanted to tell you that Larsen, uh, similar to Botvinnik, he was a great uh, researcher. He would analyze his games uh, very carefully, very thoroughly, and he would find many interesting uh, uh, discoveries in, in, in his analysis. He really liked to work on his own games. So here we have a case where Larsen is playing with the black pieces. As you can see, here we have the two central pawns, some kind of Maroxi structure, hedgehog structure. And uh, in the game, let me first tell you what happened in the game. White simply played here bishop c2, uh, protecting the pawn on b3. Larsen played knight e5, bringing the knight to g6. And the game was later a draw. However, in his analysis, Larsen found a fantastic way for White to win the game. A fantastic way for White to win the game at this point. I think many of you can already find the first move. But the difficult move to find here is the move number four. Honestly, I think it's difficult to find it over the board, but uh, I will give you the opportunity to find it. So I will give you here two minutes and uh, I can give you some hints if you send me the beginning of the variation, right? So the first move is not difficult, uh, nor is the second or third. Move number four is the difficult one, two minutes. So why to play and win, long variation. If you uh, give me move number four, uh, then you're already uh, very close to, to solving it. So here we go. White to play and uh, win. Sorry, uh, we had several students who found the right idea, but I think nobody finds number uh, four. Yeah, we have like five people found the right, uh, the first three moves. So let's uh, listen to Aradia again, who was the first one to find the right path for white. Okay, Aradia, you're on. Okay, so like my move was um, it's like the first move uh, I thought was um c5 because like as the idea of like it's kind of just opening uh, a path for bishop c4 and yeah so uh -huh. then he would okay. try to go d take c5 sure. and then i was thinking knight take f5 to open like this um a2 b1 diagonal sure. and after he takes we go bishop c4 uh -huh. and then he's yeah, probably yeah and then um now we play the move uh like queen f6 and I didn't really like see uh, much of a way to stop queen f7 and like queen g8. 
Wow, and that's also, impressive. What nice, uh, nice work, uh, uh, Araria, Queen F6. I didn't think about this move. Yeah, and also Kostya proposed Queen F6, but like some people are saying here, like uh, Arnav, perhaps we should first look at the acceptance of the sacrifice. And it, oh, it seems yeah. Like there is no mate. So oh, my other move was bishop f6 that also seemed pretty good. Ah, in interesting, of course, the same idea. But I guess again, um, I could take, no, couldn't I? So it's uh, you're very close, uh, you're on the right way, so to speak. But we shouldn't give up the bishop, uh, nor the queen at this point. We have some people who found this one. Uh, Troy found it, and also first one was uh, who found it first? Uh, I, I saw Daniel found it also the right move here. Uh, so uh, let's see here, Troy. Uh, let's uh, share with us uh, which is the move that you found here. Fantastic move for white. Very difficult to find, right? Yeah. So I couldn't. I didn't see it. I saw the first three moves, but I didn't see rook d6 here. But now you saw it once it's on the board, right? Yeah. So it's difficult to see. I mean, if my if I put myself in white shoes here, it's really difficult to find it at this point. But uh, right. it's a good exercise for calculation. Rook d6. Yeah, what is uh, white's threat here, Troy? Um, I think it's rook h6 and then... Um, Definitely, rook h7. Rook h6 yeah. and mate. Aha. So if I take on d6, what, what would follow here? Um, now you have a mating minute, combination. Aha. Uh, now the bishop is not protecting the pawn anymore, so... I think bishop g7 might work. Sure, bishop g7, sure. yeah. Aha. Queen g5. Yeah, very nice teamwork here, queen and bishop okay i cannot go to h8 then i'm mated i guess so i would have to play king f8 yeah how how will you continue troy mate queen f6. Uh -huh, queen queen f6, f6 f7 and queen f7 okay uh, so that's the right move rook d6 very difficult to find this move especially over the board and uh, i had a look at some other moves here uh, one of my ideas was to play here bishop e7 and i think larson also looked at this you can find white's next move uh, troy right this is not so difficult. Uh, um, you don't have to sack the queen anymore. Uh, you can just right. install the threat of mate. Uh, well, there are different, different um, candidates. Sorry? This was g7, king g7, queen h6 looks... But, sure. but right now it's not possible, right? I mean, the bishop is... Or, or how do you mean? Take on g7 now? Yeah, and if... Yeah. Queen h6, I don't think works. Ah, but I think my bishop is keeping control here. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm even ready to give back some some material here. So, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, your second move, you should play it straight away. Uh, your second move. Yeah, queen h6. Queen h6 right away. So again, we're threatening to give mate. And uh, black could play something like rook g8. And I think you can guess the next funny move here for white. Nice variation worked out by... The great Bent Larsen. Um, uh, how to step up the pressure? Rook g6 is interesting. Sure, of, of course, rook yeah. g6. It looks funny, but it's a, it's an extremely strong move. Also, notice that any tricks with knight e4 might fail to simply picking up the queen, right? So, right. bishop f8, and now it's time to give mate, right? All right, just taking on g8. Aha, you just take and take on g7, and it's, and it's game over. So, Thanks, Troy. Excellent work. Uh, that's what could have happened in the game. C5, fantastic sacrifice. Of course, you will not find this kind of variation unless you sit down and really work on your games. Back in those days, no engine, no stockfish to, to, to consult. You had to work out the variations by yourself. Uh, so how did Larsen draw? Well, Larsen was lucky that his opponent didn't play C5. Like I told you, there was played Bishop C2 in the game. And yeah, black held here. Some people were saying, by the way, g4, and that's, of course, in the right spirit of the position, but I think knight e5 might be interesting here. I looked at this as well. g takes a 5 and queen takes d4. Honestly, I cannot really remember if this was Larson's analysis or my own analysis. I'm not sure. But as you can see, black would be more or less alive here. So much nicer this move, c5. Very nice, uh, non-standard. Uh, sacrifice. I think there are some classical games. Is it Rubenstein? Maybe some very famous move like Rook D3, Rook H3. Well, uh, those of you who know a lot about chess history might recall this uh, idea. But uh, else, uh, I haven't seen this uh, pattern very often. Okay, let's move on. Here we have a very interesting encounter. 
Mark Taimanov is another of my favorite players. And just like Larson, he was a great optimist. He will always think that things will end up in the right way. And here Taimanov is the exchange down, but as you can see, Larson's king is in danger. So it's easy to understand Taimanov's next move here. Yeah, Taimanov is the only guy, he's also the other guy who lost to Fischer. Yeah, you're right. So Taimanov played here h3. You could consider to keep the g file uh, closed by h5, but then probably rook e1 looks interesting for white. Don't forget that opposite color bishops usually gives uh, great attacking chances for the attacker. So h3, Larsen calculated and took on h3. Taimanov's next move is not uh, difficult here. There followed bishop e5. As you can see, he's trying to give mate on, on g3 some moment. Black has to be very careful. One way in which he could try to kind of bail out here would be queen b6. In this way, he would force perhaps the knight to go to b5, and then he could play bishop f5. In this way, the queen could come to, to g6. However, Larsen, the true optimist, he played here. Oh, so he said, what about knight xd5 instead of uh, knight b5? Yeah, you're right. You can also take on d5. You're, you're completely right. You can play something like this. And probably white has some uh, compensation here for the exchange. The bishop is, is rather strong. But still, I mean, I understand Black's idea. He could bring the queen to g6 now. But any, uh, this didn't happen in the game. It's not really relevant. I'm just uh, mentioning that. It was another option. But Larsen would never, uh, well, not very often, he wouldn't bail out when uh, his opponent was attacking. He would look at the most critical reply. He played here f6. Taimano played knight e4. Now the game is getting extremely complex, as you can see. Queen g3 is coming up. And at this point, I will ask you, which do you think is Black's best move here? Try to find a way in which Black actually wins the game here. So Black to play and win. All right, <laughs> time's up. Uh, this was a difficult one. Uh, I didn't get that many answers. Only two students found this one. They were David Tay and Daniel Asaria. David was the first one to find the right solution. Okay, David, you're on. Please share with us. How did Larson save this? Hi, position? Well, I'm using my uh, dad's uh, account. Sorry? I'm using my dad's. Zoom account. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just tell me how, how to play uh, with black here. F takes e5. Queen okay, but e check. Then here we play bishop g4 because king h8. Then queen takes e5 check. Exactly. In, in this position, if we play king h8, 
we would run into queen takes e5, right? Picking up the bishop with check next move mm -hmm. with a very strong attack. As you can see that rook is waiting also to join. So the instead battle. we give up the bishop immediately. With exactly. Three. So we will give up the bishop. This is a very difficult move for most chess players to execute when you actually give up a piece uh, and it's taken with check. Uh, as far as I know, this is very difficult. But just as you say, David, after queen takes g4, somehow the white queen, it has left its circuit and now we can go to h8 and there is nothing to worry about anymore. Well, you still have to be careful, of course, but uh, white doesn't have any immediate threat here. In the game, Taimanov uh, tried knight g5. Larsen, always active defense, was his first instinct. He played here queen d2. And after rook c7, queen takes. Finally, black is able to swap queens, and he reached an endgame with an extra exchange and went on to win. Please notice that uh, when we execute this idea, uh, here we are, right? f6, knight e4. When we play here, f takes e5. We have to make sure that the pawn still is still on h3 because if you would play move like let's say h2, somehow trying to deflect some white piece, this uh, wouldn't work because here white could just take on g4 and he could play knight d6. And here you can see the big difference because if we try to take later on the pawn on f2, it's not going to be check. check. So if queen d6, for example, uh, queen d7 threatening to play rook c7, right? Queen takes, and here, if the pawn was still on h3 and the king still on g1, then black would play queen takes f2, of course. But here he's not in time. So something like this, actually, white would. Uh, would he win or, or maybe just draw? But yeah, it's not really re relevant. Uh, the relevant thing here is to notice this difficult move. Uh, bishop g4, just giving up the bishop. We cannot run away. Uh, Zoe was suggesting king f7, but I think this won't work, will it? I think I will play here simply knight g5 check and I will pick up the pawn on e5, hitting the bishop and preparing to play rook c7. Aha, so I don't think it, it will work. So very nice concept by Larsen, as you can see. Fantastic uh, player in calculations. This is what happened in the game. This is not a variation like in the previous exa example. This actually happened in the game. Bishop g4. Remember this pattern? Every time I see it uh, happen, I, I remember this uh, old game of, of Larsen's. Uh, he was one of the first players to, to find this uh, or to, to write about it also, to write about this, this interesting defensive concept. Give up your pieces with check. Okay. Now we are ready to have a look at some of his games against the world champions. Let's start with a battle against no one less than Bobby Fischer. Larsen is playing with the black pieces here. As you can see, this is a Sicilian battle. A Sicilian battle, black has the typical central pawns, which Larsen always liked. Fischer is attacking on the king side. And the pawn is perhaps hanging on e6, right? This pawn seems to be hanging. Please let me know how to con continue with black here. You can just give me a short variation, uh, about two moves, okay? Black to play and uh, obtain a, a big advantage.
All right, I didn't get many answers on this one. In the first place, let's notice that e5 is a natural move. Here, if white plays knight f5, well, black would simply play king h8. And in this way, he would be defending against the white attack and he would be trying to play a4 later on. I guess if bishop, I mean, if queen g6, bishop takes f5, this would be okay for black, right? We could even go perhaps rook c8. However, after e5, the critical move is knight e6. And I'm pretty sure that Larsen uh, noticed this. The thing is that if we play queen c8, it appears as if the knight is in huge danger, but white will simply play rook d6. Typical Sicilian battle, very tense. Both players are playing for an attack. If black plays here a4, a very nice surprise for him. I mean, a pleasant surprise for black would follow here. Uh, can anyone, can you see what white would play here? What do you think Fischl would play at this point? Yeah, Derin found this in one second. Exactly, queen takes e7. This is what Fischl had planned. And as you can see, uh, black is lost here because he has no way he can defend against the threat of, of mate, right? So I think this explains why we shouldn't play e5 at this point. Knight e6 would be very powerful for white. Uh, he's preparing to sacrifice the queen at some point on g7. And for this reason, there is a better move here, which uh, Asish found. So, Asish, you're on. Which move do you like for black here? Um, I said a4 to like... Aha. You're right. Oh. a4 is, is the best move. Let's see what happened in the game at the first point. I take on a4, and now you can play e5. What's the big difference then, Asish? If I play knight e6 here, what would you play now? What happened? Uh, how how did the position change due to the inclusion of a4 and b takes a4? Uh, uh, you should take e6, queen e6. You shouldn't, I don't think you should do that, uh, honestly. Uh, it will be difficult to attack after that. You want to take on, on you, you can't take on a4, right, due to the check. So uh, I don't think this works, or does it? Uh, uh, okay, yeah, probably, yes. So, uh, you have a much better move here. Please notice what happened on the queen side. You have a killer move here. Yeah, Danielle found it. Okay, Asish, I'm sure you can find it as well. Is it like queen c4? Of course, you can play queen yeah. c4. That's a much better place for the queen. So let's uh, suppose that white continues in the same fashion. Let's say white takes on d6. How would you continue your attack now, Asish, at this point with the black pieces? White, uh, I mean, the sacrifice is always in the air, but there are some differences now because uh, one difference is that you can give checks on f1 once the rook leaves the first rank. But also another difference is that simply you have more attacking chances. So your next move is rather obvious, isn't it? I like b3 or rook Of course, you will just play b3. Now I'm forced to play c3 and you can bring one more piece to the attack. This is not so uh, difficult. Uh, rook a4? Of course, you can just take on a4. And now you're threatening to play also rook a1 at some moment. So Larsen looked at this and he said king d2 would be the most critical move. And uh, you have a killer move here, uh, Asish. I'm sure you can find it. Uh, you don't need to attack anymore. You should just pick up the, the knight on e6. Oh, okay. No need uh, to attack. Just uh, pick up the knight. So the knight is, is defended by the rook. So for that reason, what like should we play? Uh, rook a6. Exactly. We play rook e6 and it's over. No sacrifices anymore because uh, it won't work, right? If I take, let's let's check just in case. Um, it's not going to work, I think. You're just going to take uh, back on... I'm not missing something, no? I can take in, in either way, I think. I can take with the, with the queen if I like. And it's, it's not going to work here. No perpetual war. So. Yeah, that's it. Maybe you didn't see all of this, uh, Asish, but uh, you found the right move. And uh, so did Larsen. A4 first, and only after b takes a4, we play e5. Because in this way, you can say that we kind of win a tempo also for our, our attack, right? Because if we play the other way around, like we were saying, uh, yeah, the queen doesn't uh, find such a nice square as c4. And this is what makes it possible for white to continue attacking. I mean, white has no reason at all to take now on, on a4. We already saw the nice sacrifice queen takes g7. So it's important with timing in these uh, positions with 
uh, neutral attacks on opposite flanks. So very nice move, a4. If knight takes e6 straight away, black would simply play here queen c8. And again, you can see that this is too much for white to handle. Apart from attacking the knight, we're attacking to take on, we're threatening to take on b3. So a4, pawn takes, e5, this is how the game went. Fischer played knight e6. And after queen c4, Fischer simply gave away the piece. He played here b3, but he couldn't save this endgame. Larsen was also a very good endgame player. As you can see, he's, he has a material advantage here. The bishop is strong in this endgame, and he went on to win. So, uh, yeah, David says that Fischer was greater than Larsen. Yeah, I guess you're right, but in this game, uh, Larsen won. And we're talking 1970, right? Uh, very close to Fischer becoming world champion. Fischer was in good, good shape back then. And you can also say that Fischer and Larsen, they were two of the very few players who were able to beat uh, the guys from the Soviet Union who were dominating chess back in those days. Very, very few players from the West, so to speak, were able to, to threaten uh, strong players like, you know, uh, Spassky, Petrosian, Tal, Yell, uh, and so on. Okay, so very nice example. This is how Larsen dealt with Fischer. Uh, let's see his game with another world champion, Larsen against Petrosian. As you can see, we have, a, again, we have a Maroxi structure. Larsen loved to play this with black, as always the feature with the central pawns. But here he's actually playing with the white pieces. And as you can see, uh, he didn't try to uh, win against Petrosian in a slow maneuvering fashion. He already pushed f5. This is already a very double-edged uh, idea for white because in the end game, you will be suffering due to the weak pawn on e4 and the square on e5 and so on. But of course, Larsen is going for an attack here. Let's see what happened in the game. The next move is not difficult to understand. Larsen simply played here um, f takes g6. He needs to open up the position for the attack. And obviously, the bishop is, was just waiting for this. This bishop on, F, on g4 is uh, now, it has some new perspectives here. Uh, Black took with the h-pawn, so to keep his kingside safe. Larsen played queen f2, eyeing the pawn on f7. Petrosian, rook f8. And here follows what Larsen called the best move in the game. Let's see if somebody can find the best move here in the game. It's impossible to see all the variations, but if you can just tell me the best move and what it's good for, uh, that's enough. I will just give you one minute here. One minute, tell me which move do you like the most and uh, what is it good for? So we had many different uh, ideas here. Some people were saying bishop takes e5. You can win the queen here, right? With knight f6. However, in this kind of position, uh, this is well known for among Maroxi players. Black is okay here. He's solid in, in this position. We, I think we saw an example of this in the Anderson lecture. Um, he, Black has a good uh, counterplay, the dog squares or weak. So this is not White's uh, best uh, chance. But then some people were saying, yeah, Black might even be better, uh, says uh, Arnor, if he managed to play at some moment Bishop d4. Yeah, I, I like this for, for Black. I wouldn't enter this with White. Another move which some people were saying uh, was Queen h4. This is very logical, bringing the Queen to the attack. You can already uh, consider some ideas like Rook f3, Rook h3, and so on. But Larsen didn't play like this. 
that if you play the accelerated dragon with black, you know for sure that very often the exchange of the light squad bishop for the white knight is a good deal for black. That knight is very strong and sometimes this bishop is actually the worst of black's three minor pieces, right? So bishop takes d5 and after let's say rook takes d5, black would simply play here e6. When I looked at this position, of course, I checked bishop g5. And I was ready to play here, e takes d5, <laughs> sacrifice the queen again. It's not as good as last time, but still I like this for, for black. I don't take the pawn uh, to win a pawn, really. I, I do it in order to prevent b4, right? So that the knight stays on c5. I think black should be okay here, uh, like a fortress kind of position, but the computer finds a much better move. The computer says here queen b6. So this is very nasty, very strong for, for black. Uh, please notice that it's not easy for white to uh, come up with an attack here. For example, this bishop is not a good attacking piece anymore. But once Larsen noticed uh, this variation, this pattern with uh, queen h4, he saw that he could actually improve this variation. He could improve it. And I thought that perhaps somebody would find it. Well, actually, David found it, but uh, he couldn't uh, speak at this moment. So the right move here is the very surprising move, e5. Once you see the move, it's very obvious. That pawn was bad anyway. So now we just give it up. We clear some space. And also we force the black bishop to move away from its best post, which is on g7, of course, for defensive purposes. So e5, very strong move. Bishop takes e5. Please remember that Petrosian was one of the best defenders in the world at that time. Let's see here what happened. Again, we shouldn't uh, take that queen. We don't get very much material for it. Uh, black is very solid here. That was not Larsen's idea. Instead, he played here queen h4. And here you can already see the difference. After bishop takes d5, notice please that he cannot protect the pawn on e7. In that case, white would win by a standard sacrifice known by anyone who plays uh, open Sicilian with white. Rook takes f7 and queen h7, right? Rook f1 is coming up as well. So uh, Petrosian took uh, on d5. Rook takes d5. And here you can see the difference. Last time I was saying that I would play e6, right? We saw this in the previous variation. But there, the bishop was still on g7. Here, however, the bishop has been tricked to move to e5. And this means that white could go for an, a better endgame here. He could take on d8 and he could take on e5. So d takes e5, bishop takes e5, white has the two bishops. However, Larsen uh, correctly felt that still this might have been black's best chance. He felt that black should have some activity here. He was mentioning the move f5 followed by rook d2, while another idea for black might be to play here rook a c8, simply bringing the rook to the action. I think that white is slightly better and uh, he doesn't risk much really. The, the bishop is very strong in the endgame, but this would have been perhaps Black's best chance. Petrosian, after the game, said that knight e4 would have been better, bringing the knight to f6. But Larsen refuted this argument, saying that after bishop f3, knight f6, rook b5, white would still be better. You can see the pawn on b7 will soon fall. White still has the bishop. Power. And please notice how white's position improved once he got rid of that pawn on e4. It was a real relief for white to get rid of that pawn, right? Okay, let's see what happened in the game. Petrosian played knight e6, and you already know what Larsen had in mind. Of course, we should bring the rook to the attack. And this is actually the last chance for Petrosian. Larsen studied this position. He made a huge research here. He noticed that f5 would have been the best move, rook h3 and knight g7. There are some very long variations here. Uh, we won't look at all of them, but let me just tell you that one of Larsen's conclusions was that he should not give check on h7. It's much more flexible for him to retreat the bishop first. So he would play here bishop f3. And then he can go queen h7 at some moment. Uh, well, there are many variations here. One of them is king f7 anyway. Yeah, you're right, Austin. Long variation, wrong variation, uh, said Bent Larsen. 
but actually he himself uh, had a lot of long variation in, in his proofs. So maybe it, this was auto criticism. Who, who knows? Root p5. This was analyzed by Larsen, and he was saying that after rook h8, white would, would be much better here after uh, bishop d5 and queen g5. And I think he's right. This looks nice for white. There is only one problem with this, uh, with this variation. It's that black is not forced to play here, rook h8. Stockfish claims that a good move for black would actually be b6. For, for black, sorry, giving up the exchange. And Larsen had this position on the board. He said here, bishop d4 with a clear advantage for white. And here, let me ask you a question. Who finds black's best move here? Which is the move that Larsen actually overlooked in his analysis? What would you play with the black pieces here? You can just send me the move to the, to the chat. G5, says Sarvagna. Interesting move, G5. I would play queen F2, I guess, in that case. Who finds black best move, Stockfish? Yeah, but now we're among humans. So it's nice to see what uh, Stockfish has in mind, but uh, we can't use him during a game, right? So we have to learn to analyze ourselves. Queen c6 or queen e4, says Aradia. Don't forget, Aradia, that we're currently exchanged down. a6, says Austin. That's a reasonable move. Maybe I could second e5 then. Rook takes e5. What do you think? Looks nice for white. Giving back the exchange, but I have a monster bishop on e5. Yeah, bravo, Asish. You found it. Asish found the move. Rook h8. Very nice. This was not uh, noticed by Larsen. Very nice. Now, actually, black is two exchanges down. But look at this position. Fantastic. Fantastic position for, for black. A lot of attack there. The white rooks are not well coordinated. Aha. So, what can I say? Extremely difficult to see all this dur during the game, right? Over the board. No uh, wonder that Petrosian failed here. He played bishop f6. This is already a losing mistake. Let's see if anyone can find Larsen's winning combination here. Just give me a variation of two moves. The second move is the killer move, okay? So two minutes, no, one minute only, yeah? Have to do this quickly. Why to play and win? Why to play and win? The second move is very important. I'm sorry guys, it's not a sacrifice on f6. Don't take on f6. That's not the solution, okay? Don't take that... Uh, don't take that bishop, okay? Should I give you one more minute? I'm just waiting for one student to find the, the right move, the right second move. Some people find the, the right first move, but I'm waiting for the second move. Yeah, which should be your candidate moves here? I mean, the queen is under attack. Yeah, you, ha you have the right move, the first move, Austin. That's not difficult. The second move is difficult. So, one more minute. Um, why to play and win? The first move is the most obvious move. And the second move is not obvious at all, okay? Yeah, bravo, Jason found this one. Let's uh, listen to Jason to win time. You're on, Jason. How did Larsen proceed here? Queen h6. Aha, queen h6, threatening to give mate. Black played bishop g7 and? Queen takes g6. Exactly. Once you see it, it's very obvious, of course, but it's not so easy to see when you're uh, analyzing. How far did you see here, Jason, or you simply presume that it's, this is the right way to go? 
Well, it looks like F takes G6, Bishop takes E6, check. Uh -huh. um, Rook H3. And here. Um, Bishop takes H6. Exactly. That's a key move. I hope uh, you, have, you would have found it also without seeing the final position. This must be seen in advance. If we take uh, with the Rook, then I guess, well, I, I guess Black should be, be okay here somehow. Rook F6 coming up. But uh, taking with the bishop, it's it's terminal for Black. No way he can survive here. Larsen looked at rook f5, but he noticed that actually we can take on f5 with a rook. And here we have a nice move for White, uh, Jason. Uh, which move would that be? Bishop f7. Exactly. We should go for a mating net here. Bishop f7. Very nice. Uh, only one check uh, left here for Black. Okay, you could win by bishop e3 as well, right? But yeah, Larsen simply gives. King h1, and I think it's inevitable mate. Next move. Okay, excellent, uh, Jason. Thanks. So, Queen takes e6 is happening in the game. There is no way that uh, Petrosian can save this. He tried in the game, intermediate move, knight f4. Uh, best try, probably, uh, so that the rook cannot go to h3 anymore. I guess that's the main idea here. And he gave up the rook as well. We already know the story here. We should, of course, take with the bishop. Okay, so rook f7. And there are many ways, I think, to win this, this position. Uh, but I like the way that uh, Larsen played. He took with a rook. And after king h8, he played a very powerful move. I mean, it's easy to find this move if you look carefully at the white pieces. The one which should be improved here is the other rook. So he played here rook g5. Although I guess that rook f3 should win as well. Shouldn't it? I guess so. Yeah. What a fantastic bishop on e6, by the way. Completely paralyzing the black position. But Okay, I, li I like rook g5. Uh, b5, desperate move. Uh, Larsen says that uh, Petrosian was planning to go for a counterattack, but it's a little late here. Rook g3 and game over. Fantastic game. Uh, not easy at all to beat uh, Tigran Petrosian in this way. Uh, what we have seen here is a very strong attack in the Maroxi structure. And please remember, if you should remember anything from this game, please remember the move e5. Uh, like Larsen himself, he himself said, this was the key move of the game, e5. Fantastic concept. We have a weak pawn. Why not give it away straight away in order to win time for our attack? And uh, analysis show that Petrosian perhaps could have saved himself here if he would play like a computer. But uh, yeah, for humans, this is very difficult. Very nice sacrifice on g6. Very nice queen sacrifice. Okay. And uh, the next logical step is to see how Larsen one against Anatoly Karpov. I think he bet Karpov twice with the black pieces. There is a Scandinavian game that he won, but I wanted to show you the game in the Petrov. And we haven't talked uh, that much about uh, Larsen's uh, opening play. I would say that he was universal. He played a lot of uh, strange uh, variations, such as, uh, you know, b3 on move one. He would play sometimes f4, uh, also with black, all this kind of stuff with with b5. Yeah, there are many weird openings in his games, but he would also play like mainstream openings. Uh, he was very flexible and he would adapt his openings to the uh, next opponent on the board. And here, for some reason, he had looked into the Petrov defense. It doesn't look like uh, one of Larsen's openings, but uh, he worked really well on this uh, opening. And let's see what he found here. A typical variation, which is played a lot, Today as well, uh, maybe you saw Carson playing knight c3. Lately, he had a nice game where he won against Wesley Saw, I think, uh, in this kind of, of position with uh, double pawns on the on the c file, but with a space advantage and the pawn majority in the center. So that's uh, Larsen's, uh, I mean, Carson's line here. Anatoly Karpov played queen e2. The other move which is played a lot nowadays is simply to take and cast all and play c4. I mean, this is kind of mainline. Uh, anyway, queen e2 was played back in those days. After knight takes e5, bishop takes e4, d takes, queen takes. Actually, white wins a pawn. But as you can see, he's now left without the bishop card. Black has the bishop card. And I would say in some way this is similar to the martial attack. You give up the d pawn with the black pieces, but you get some attacking perspectives here. Queen d7, white castle short, and black castle long. If we look carefully at this position, we can see that black is threatening to take the pawn. And that 
uh, explains, yeah, Mars attack without a pair of knights and castling long. Yeah, something like that. Interesting. Uh, in the Ray Lopez, you're forced to castle short, right? So you, you cannot get here, really. So black, white played here, bishop e3. And here, Larsen made a fantastic discovery. He made a fantastic discovery. Uh, he found a prophylactic move, which ever since uh, this day has been played many times. So I will just give you one minute and see if you can find the very nice prophylactic move which Larsen played here. One minute. Surprising prophylactic move or restrictive move by Black. Please try to understand what is White about to play here. Okay, time's up. I'm sorry, guys. Nobody found this move. Well, Larsen did, but uh, here nobody found it. The thing is that if we play bishop d6, this is the first move that we should look at. White would play queen a5. Karpov would bring his queen uh, to the attack. And we should be very careful not play king b8, for example, d5 coming up, right? So, white uh, has a clear idea in playing queen a5. And how can we prevent this? I think here, uh, somebody said b6, was it uh, Jason perhaps? Yeah, I, I guess b6 is possible, just that you weaken your queen side, right? I think I would play knight c3, perhaps queen e4, try to go d5 and so on. Okay, Jason, you found the move. Share with us, uh, Jason, what did uh, Larsen play here? Yeah, bishop b4. Weird, right? St strange move, bishop b4. What on earth is the bishop doing there? He's not attacking anything. But uh, if I play now, let's say c3, what would follow? Now F6. or never? Exactly. Now we play f6. Exactly. In this way, we don't let him play queen a5. He would have to retreat the queen somehow. It wouldn't make sense to play queen h5, right? I guess in this case, you could play, well, bishop g4 or bishop f7 or whatever. So black would have to go back. I mean, white would have to go back with the queen. And here you could simply move your bishop again. Uh, it looks tempting to play bishop d6. However, in that case, white would probably play bishop f4. And we shouldn't swap bishops, of course. We're a pawn down and uh, we have the bishop there. So which do you think is uh, black's uh, correct move here, uh, Jason? And which is black's plan, by the way? Um, bishop e7. With... Exactly. We should just play bishop e7. Definitely, we don't have to worry about this pawn, right? That would be a gift to us. That he takes that pawn. And uh, what would, would be your plan after that? Simple, right? H5, H4. Yeah, exactly. Just push the pawns. Exactly. You're right. That's what uh, Larsen is looking for here. Okay, thanks, uh, Jason. Great work. And this is how they play today, actually. This is how this variation has evolved, and this is how they play nowadays. But if you look in the database, you will see that the first, very first game in this variation is this game. The first time Bishop before was played was in this game. Larsen found this very nice move and it helped him to beat no one less than Anatoly Karpov, who was the reigning world champion. He was always un unbeatable in the 1980s before Kasparov showed up, right? So in the game, there followed knight c3, there was f6, just like Jason said. Now we take the opportunity to kick away the queen when it cannot go to a5 anymore. That was the idea behind this strange prophylactic move, bishop b4. After queen g3, here again, Larsen had to make up his mind. He could have attacked, like Jason said, with h5. But he noticed that in this case, white could trade off uh, black's bishop bar by means of the very useful move d5. He would give up that pawn so that 
you could play here and move like queen g6, and it would not be easy for black to progress anymore. Maybe he could make a draw here without much effort. I'm sure this, this would not be that difficult for black. But like I told you, Larsen, usually he wasn't interested in draws. It was either win or lose. Very much uh, different from uh, Petrosian or Anderson, which we looked at uh, last time. So after queen g3, Larsen actually took on c3. And I think all of you notice what will happen here, right? We're now entering a kind of opposite color bishop's position where the black bishop will be much stronger. And as you all know, in position with opposite colored bishops, the side playing for an attack uh, will have very good prospects. It's a good scenario for the attacking player. And here we just have to make sure, should we play h5 or should we play g5? What do you think? Does anybody have a theory about that? Which pawn should be moved first? Is there perhaps some scientific explanation? Yeah, it's not difficult to, to say h5 to push. Aha. Uh -huh. um, yeah, actually, h5 is the right move because if g5, Larson explains, I say Larson explains that here f3 would help white and he would just be able to bring back the queen and play h3, and it would be more difficult for black to progress here. Austin says, I would push h pawn because it's with tempo. Yeah, and you're, you're kind of right because here we can see a big difference. If white plays f3, black would of course play h4 and after queen f2, yeah, it doesn't make sense to go to, to g6 of course. The queen would just run into trouble, right? After queen f2, we're just in time to play key move h3. And as you can see, this is extremely important because once we manage to play h3, we can always put our bishop on d5, and this will be a good bishop forever. And we will have uh, mating patterns on the long diagonal. Of course, white is really uh, suffering from this bad structure. It, it completely deprives him of Karpo play. In the game after h5, Karpo played h4, and I'm sure that all of you uh, know what black should play here, right? What would you play with black, anyone? Of course, uh, g5 exactly now the time is right to go g5 we should just open up the position if h takes h4 this is just terrible for white karpov was a good very good defensive player he played here f3 rook dg8 and rook f2 uh, karpov managed to stabilize you can say the king side unfortunately the king side is not the only part of the board now black can play on the opposite uh, flank as well. Oh, I mean, at the whole board at the same time. He played here queen c6, attacking the pawn on c3, and after bishop e2, g4. As you can see, finally, our bishop will become a very strong piece now. Uh, White's next move is extremely ugly, but uh, what to play here? I mean, taking on g4 would just open up the g-file for the black uh, attack. Yeah, of course, no way that uh, black will swap queens here, right? He will just play bishop d5, I think. So Karpov had to play the extremely ugly move, f4. This is nightmare for white with this bad bishop on d2. Bishop c4, preparing to go rook e8 and work on the e-file. Uh, d5, sacking a pawn to get some space, but uh, it didn't change the final verdict here. Later on, Larsen went on to win. So I really like this example. Uh, very interesting way of conducting the attack uh, opposite uh, flanks. But uh, also it's interesting to notice that he prepared his opening very well and he found this move bishop b4. Weird move until you look further into the position and you understand that he would like to go queen a5. White, I mean, would like to go queen a5. So you should play this, for this first and only then play f6. You can check the opening theory and you will notice that this is now the main line here. And uh, nowadays white doesn't really like to go into this variation anymore. Uh, it seems to be rather promising for black. Okay, what's next? That's, this is another of my favorite examples. Yeah, this is just a fantastic example. Uh, Larsen against uh, Kavalek, and another very strong player uh, from that period, from the Czech Republic, and later on he settled in the United States, I think. White to play, uh, we don't have much time. Maybe we should just do it in one minute here. Uh, Try to find Larsen's very nice attacking idea here. White to play, uh, one minute.
I will give you one more minute, but let me tell you something also. Larsen was great in dynamic play. He really liked complex pawn structures, closed positions with a lot of pawn breaks, uh, pawn play dynamics and so on. So that's the hint. One more minute, white play and uh, basically win this game. Okay, time's up. We had three winners here, Sarvagna, Jason, and Alexander Wang. Sarvagna, you were the fastest one. Please share with us how to continue with white here. So I was thinking about all the, like, not all the pawn, pawn breaks, but I was thinking about pawn break, and it was G4. G4 looked pretty uh -huh. good. And, um, I mean, after F takes, it's just easy, because, like, knight takes E4. But after pawn, a knight takes, yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm just showing that this, this knight becomes very strong, right, in the center. So yeah, in the game they took with the knight, of course. Okay, please continue. Knight takes and then f3. Uh huh. Nice f3. Uh, black had to take, else uh, yeah, white would take anyway. Uh, okay, and what's the point here, Sarvagna? What will happen once uh, black retreats that uh, knight? Uh, what uh, what will you play here? Um, you could play queen h2. To exactly. H2. So that that's what happened here. White played here queen h2, and uh, as you can see, if we look again from the beginning. It's not so easy to find a way to bring the queen. Some people were saying queen e1, queen g1, and queen h2. And I mean, that looks interesting as well, but it's uh, rather slow, I think. Well, in this way, g4, we're kind of combining attacking play and, uh, and positional play, because just like Sarvagna says, if uh, black takes with the pawn, then his pawn structure is ruined. So let's continue with the game. Knight takes, f3, pawn takes, bishop takes. The knight had to move away. Uh, and here we have a nice move, queen h2. At this point, it's very difficult for Black already to survive, but uh, Kavalek came up with an interesting try. He played here before taking on uh, f3. He cannot take right now due to the mating threat, so he first take, took on c4. Take and take. Okay, so how would you continue, Sarvagna, at this point? Uh, how to continue this attack? I think the two next moves are not difficult. Mm. Just go for mate, okay? Uh, queen h7. Yeah, queen h7, king f7. Knight c5. Um, aha, I'm threatening to play rook h8, so white should hurry to create new threats. Now queen takes g7 is threatened. Kavalek had to play rook g8. And at first point, this looks like it's just game over, right? Uh, which is your next move, uh, Sarvagna? Um, yeah, not difficult. Knight takes e7. Sure, knight takes e7. Yeah, like I'm saying, it looks like if, if it's game over. But uh, it's not, because black is not forced to take on, on e7. Taking on e7 would lead to instant uh, defeat, if I'm not mistaken. White would just take, and he could then take on uh, g7 and give check on e6, next move, and so on. However, in the game, uh, Kavalek found a clever uh, counterattack. He played rook d8. At this point, yeah, thanks, uh, Sarvagna. At this point, I would like to ask everybody to send me white's best move. Try to... Really be careful here and try to find the best choice for white. Many tempting options, but there are only one or perhaps two moves which will win the game for white. Okay, white's best move, please.
Okay, time's up. We had uh, different uh, suggestions uh, here. Um, I had a comment here in the chat. Evan Han says, after bishop takes f7, rook takes g7, you could play rook h8 with mate. Um, let me see what, in what variation was that, uh, Evan? I, I don't uh, follow here. When did that happen? Here, maybe? No, I, I don't follow. After queen takes e7. So. Oh, you're saying that you could give mate with a, with a rook as well. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you can give mate with a rook. Okay, excellent. So, in the game, um, Kavarek played a very clever move, rook b8. And I think only Jason found the right move here. So, Jason, please uh, share with us what to play here. In a1, to step out King of the pin. A1, stepping out of the pin. Excellent. And uh, how could you explain this move? I mean, I could take on b2 anywhere, right? But what's the big difference? What happens if I take now? Queen takes g8. Exactly. Sure. Now the, the rook is undefended. So white would just take on, on g8 and it would be mate here if rook takes its mating one, I think. And also if the king goes upwards, I think he's also going to be mated very soon, right? Something like 95 and I think I could even give the... Yeah. What do you think, Jason? This looks promising, right? Or I'm you could check. take on g7. Sorry? You could take the bishop. Oh, I can just take on g7. Yeah, of course, that's simpler. No perpetuals, right? You already calculated that you can just play king b2 and checks are over. Yeah, nice. So, uh, the nice thing about this move, rook king a1, is that we gain more flexibility. We, we move the king first, so to speak. And only then uh, we will adapt our play depending on black's play. So after king a1, uh, rook takes is impossible due to queen takes g8. And another move which we had in, in the pocket, so to speak, queen takes g6. We can use this move in the event of queen takes e7. If black takes on e7, we could now take with the queen g6. And that's exactly what happened in the game. But I, I want you to understand this uh, detail, everybody, that uh, if I would take immediately on g6, if I take immediately, well, then black could take on e7 and he would still be alive, I think, in this position. The king would have some hope of, of escaping. Uh, Evan, you, you want to say something? What? Uh, sorry, Jason, let's, let's let uh, Evan in here. He wants to say something. Okay, Evan, you're on. You can speak, no problem. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe some technical uh, issue there. So back to uh, to Jason. Jason found the move, rook. Uh, sorry, king a1. But uh, let me tell you something, uh, Jason. There is actually a better move than king a1. Your move is excellent. That's what Larsen played, and he won the game. But Larsen himself stated that there was a better move here. And which do you think is the better move? Just by chance, uh, <laughs> what other move comes to your mind? King C1. Exactly. King C1 is better, but it's not easy to see, of course. But we will look at this now. So King A1, very flexible move. Uh, we step out of the check in advance, so to speak. Rook takes is impossible due to Queen takes D8. If King takes on E7, we can take on G7. This is a big difference, of course, and Black's attack is over now that that bishop is gone. So uh, one critical variation would be to take on B2 um, Sorry, one critical variation here is to take on e7. That's what happened in the game. Yeah, queen takes. And here Larsen noticed that had he uh, put his king on c1 instead, he could win the game by simply bishop takes g7. Because then he would have check next move, right? With a knight or like Evan said, with a rook. Unfortunately, since he put his king on a1, this doesn't work anymore because black could now take with check. And white would be forced to enter this end game, which still would be perhaps better for white, but it's of course not what uh, white is looking for. So how would you continue now, Jason? It's not difficult. You just have to keep up the attack. How to continue here? Yeah, not, not difficult, uh, Jason. Just uh, use uh, all your pieces. Um, 96. Sure, 96. That's what we should play here. Of course, Black's only legal move is queen takes. 
he's preparing to give perpetual, uh, but uh, we won't give him a chance to to give perpetual, right? Uh, yeah, you can even lo lose this game here if you play king c2. You can end up losing the game. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you play here king uh, d3, I would play knight e5, right? I think this should should eventually lose for black. Yeah, it, it, for lose for white. I mean, yeah, this this loses. So. Um, how to continue, Jason? Yeah, if it's not queen takes queen, it must be... Bishop takes g7. Yeah, definitely. So, black cannot take, he would lose his queen. He has to play here king e7. Still, material is, is balanced. Yeah, you already found the sequence, right? Yeah, bishop f8 and then rook h7. Ah, bishop f8, that's a very nice uh, check. Here, if black takes... Well, it's the same procedure, more or less. In the game, uh, they took with a B rook. Yeah, how do you finish off uh, black now? Rook uh, h7. Sure, rook h7. Black resigned here. Uh, he saw the final combination after rook f7. What will rook follow? Rook h7. Aha. Please notice, everybody, that we should not uh, even think about uh, getting the exchange because black will have some, some counterplay there. With the queen, perhaps. So, yeah, rook takes f7, queen takes f7. We have a mate coming up here. Exactly, takes and, and mate. So, that's uh, how the game uh, could have ended. After rook h7, uh, Kavalek uh, resigned. So, what was this example? Thanks, uh, Jason. What was this example about in the first place? About dynamics. In such a position, uh, black has a strong pawn chain it, and it makes sense to softening up with g4. But it's also about attacking uh, as quickly as, as you can. So in this way, we bring all our pieces to the attack. And the very nice moment, which I like about this game, is here when Kavalek uh, creates a very strong attack and uh, Larsen finds the very precise move, King A1, uh, prophylactics in the attack, so to speak. And even stronger, like Jason saw here, was King C1, with the same idea of stepping out of the check, uh, getting more flexibility on the next move. Depending on black's next move, we will do different things, right? If rook takes, queen takes g8. And if queen takes, like in the game, queen takes.